Okay, great. Uh, you'll see me dipping down into a couple of little bags here for a couple of little things, but that's okay. Um, we'll see how this goes. I'm going to try and do something I've not done before just see how it works. Um, it really is my pleasure uh, to be here to talk to you today. I guess I, I'm not really a, a pure antibody person per se. I'm a, a protein biochemist, a protein chemist if you like. And why I'm here is because we in my lab have developed an approach and a technology that uh, we have, think has really good application, particularly in antibody validation. Okay. So the approach we've developed, here we call the quantitative understanding of biomolecular edge shift, and that's quite hard, so we call it cubes. I think that sounds cute. You've got to have a cute name, I think, in the business. Um, and what it does is it very accurately and sensitively tracks the stability and the conformation of proteins. Okay. I think a big problem in uh, any protein biotechnology is uh, one of trying to understand what you've got in hand. And proteins are terrible because they're really, really unstable. Okay, proteins are unstable compared to paracetamol or aspirin, right? So the problem you've got is to try to make them stable. And that's what formulation scientists do all day, every day. And they do a fantastic job of it. And it's such a big problem that we waste hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And I think about therapeutic monoclonal antibodies just because that's kind of what I think about. And we really do waste vast amounts in failed QC. The problem there is because only very small changes in temperature or even small changes in container can very, very easily drive aggregation. I do think about therapeutics. And even soluble aggregates at low levels for therapeutic antibodies are toxic. Okay, it's really, really bad news. You can't give that to someone. What would be great is when you're formulating a new antibody is if you could actually predict the stability of your formulations. And there's nothing that does that at the moment. You can't do that but it would be very powerful if you could. So at the start of your product life cycle, if you could predict stability. As you go through, you're always having to do QC and QA to check that your sample looks the way it should. And unfortunately, the way we do quality assurance of antibodies structurally, so when you deliver to the NHS, you have to provide some sort of structural characterization. The way we do it is really poor. The techniques are rubbish, they're expensive, and they're technically very, very complex. And our approach, is very, very fast, okay? We are able to predict the stability of proteins in pretty much any buffer condition with a tiny amount of protein. It's non-destructive, you get it back, and it's much more faster and much more accurate than existing approaches. And the way it works is we put different energies of light into a protein, and we look at how the emitted light comes back to us, and we get something rather beautiful. That's the raw data. It really is rather beautiful, but it's very, very complex, so it's kind of useless. Okay, something beautiful that's complex, kind of really, really difficult as an assay technique. What we do is we do a bit of maths and we'll take all that complexity and we retain the complexity, but we give a spot. We turn it into a spot in three-dimensional space with an X, a Y and a Z axis. And where that spot sits tells you everything you need to know about the structure and stability of your protein, your antibody in this case. We can tell you, depending on where the spot moves, whether it's being, your protein's being stabilized, destabilized, whether it's unfolding or whether it's aggregating. And we can be truly quantitative. Okay. So these are quite big claims, very big claims. And my job today, I think, is just to show you the evidence to prove to you that it all works as it should. The reason our approach, I guess, is so powerful, and I can back up my claims, is because our detection approach is completely unique. Our approach actually detects at the level of protein flexibility. So we all know that proteins are made up of primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, and even something called quinary structure. That's how protein structure interacts with its environment. But what governs everything at every level of protein structure is actually the molecular flexibility of your protein. So if anything changes about the flexibility of your protein, anything changes about the stru any of those structural levels of your protein, something will change about the flexibility. And nothing detects flexibility, maybe some very, very high level approaches, but nothing you use routinely can detect protein flexibility, and our approach does. What, what do I mean by flexibility? It's actually slightly abstract, because we're at least looking at crystal structures all the time, right? And that's proteins. Proteins are a nice crystal structure. And they're not. That's not quite true. Uh, that's what a protein looks like. Yeah? All proteins move. All proteins are mobile. All proteins are generally very flexible, relatively flexible compared to other things, because they're big colloids. Okay? And that's what a protein really, really looks like. And that's what our approach detects. It detects the wobbliness. 
And let me prove it to you. We, we validate that in lots of different ways that it detects. You know, being a biophysicist, we go to town on it, and there's all sorts. I think one of the cutest things uh, that we've done in terms of validation is to take a protein, and there's my spot. That's what my protein looks like, okay? We've got a point variant of that protein, which doesn't do anything to the three-dimensional structure. Crystal structure looks identical, but it's generally more rigid as a protein. And what we find is our spot shifts purely based on the rigidity of the system off to the left as you're looking at it. And that's a general trend that always happens when proteins become more rigid looking by this approach. What about making things more flexible? Well, again, as a biophysicist, a good way to make anything as a colloid more flexible, you just heat it up. So you apply a bit of temperature to both of these, and we can see both of the spots shift over to the right, and that is going more flexible. Okay, so over here is rigid, over here is flexible. And I'll always show this figure in the same orientation. So anything over here is more rigid, anything over here is more flexible. My lab really does think about the main thing we think about is the functional importance of protein flexibility. And, and antibodies are beautiful examples of that. They're huge and they're really, really flexible. But the native flexibility of antibodies is a large part of what makes them uh, so excellent at recognizing their targets and so diverse in their ability to recognize different targets. So we wonder whether actually we could apply our approach to looking at antibodies. And I initially imagined and envisaged this is something that we would do as quality control. So for the NHS, so when you're making therapeutic antibodies to the NHS, I envisaged that what we would do is we would, because our detection sensitivity was so good, we would come in and we would be able to tell you whether your antibody looked the way that it should, because we should have really good detection sensitivity for flexible proteins. Okay, so all the antibodies I'm gonna talk about here today are IgG2 and IgG4, they're pretty close, pretty much all of them are IgG2. Uh, here's a bunch of zoom apps that I looked at, and the names are on the bottom. And the thing about all of these structures are they're pretty much identical in three-dimensional space. Certainly the secondary structure is pretty much identical, and the tertiary structure is identical. By light scattering, they all give exactly the same peak, because they're all more or less the same size. But by our approach, you can see we have absolutely outstanding separation of your spots. And that is because each of those antibodies has a very characteristic type of flexibility, and that's what we're detecting. So this is really quite extraordinary separation. One of the nice things here is um, trastuzumab uh, and trastuzumab mtansen. And they're both very, very different in flexibility, and that's actually a general phenomenon of binding something to another protein. It's so sensitive that we can separate all our zoomabs, but we can also class things. So here in red, all my zoomabs, cluster nicely in a little balloon. And my Zmabs that we looked at clustered nicely in a little balloon. And we only have one Umab, Nivolumab. But he kind of comes away on his own. He's out here a little bit on his own. But they do cluster. And that's kind of, again, demonstrating you that we're capturing class-based differences in flexibility. So the power is really evident. This was really great, OK? Really exciting, just from a fundamental point of view. But what's the point? If the sensitivity is so good, as I say, if we're capturing that information on molecular flexibility, we should be sensitive to changes in all levels of protein structure, so secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And the way you detect that at the moment is you have an individual tool or technique that does each layer of structure. Nothing does everything. But I reason that, well, we're looking at flexibility, so we do capture everything, but prove it. What we did was we took a bunch of antibodies, and we sat them in urea. And urea is going to stop things aggregating, but it's going to very quickly drive unfolding. And what we found was when we did that, all our native antibodies swung up high and tight and clustered over here in a little unfolded category. Similarly, we just sat our antibodies with a little bit of heat, not too much. We just tickle them just to form a very, very low level of soluble aggregates. We're talking kind of like decimers. I don't care about visible aggregates because I can see them with my eyes. So as a spectroscopist, that's useless. I like the secret stuff that's hidden. And the soluble aggregates are the things that people worry about as well. And when we form the soluble aggregates, you can see they swing out and away and again form their own clustered grouping. I said to you before that the approach, so this is quite cute, so you get separation. Okay, that's nice. But I'm, I'm quite a quantitative person. I like a hard number on things. And if you titrate in an, aggregate, an aggregated antibody into a native or an unfolded antibody into a native, we can find that we get essentially a linear trend on the bottom, on the floor of my figure here. And that means you can truly assess the fraction of aggregated 
or unfolded material. And we find with our approach, we've got a sensitivity of between 2 and 5% for the detection of unfolded and aggregated protein. And I'll point out again, they're aggregates that are soluble and at a very, very early stage. I'll show you some DLS profiles. So, so you know, I'm not really, a, I'm not really a, uh, an antibody person, as I say, and I've learned an awful lot, and I've learned a lot by being at this meeting, I have to say. Uh, but I did ask Randy Mersney what he thought when we were kind of getting this stuff together uh, and what the kind of evidence we would want to see and what people would like to see. And he said, well, of course, what you've got to do is you've got to benchmark against existing techniques. Now, CD is kind of notoriously bad, and that's fine. Everything looks the same by CD because they're just all beta sheep. Uh, DLS is potentially really informative, particularly for capturing these potentially toxic soluble aggregates. Uh, so what I've got here is I just sat an antibody and we just incubated it at a relatively low temperature for a longish period of time, a couple of hours. And we looked at the corresponding light scattering profile. And what we found that these are half hour slices, even at the earliest time point, we see on our cubes data, we get a swing away from the native. Okay, so something's happened. The way people use light scattering in a quantitative sense is what's called looking at the volume data. You can use intensity data, but it's generally prone to false positives, so it's not so favored. When you use volume data, we find that the volume data, which is our dash line, doesn't have any difference in one and a half hours, but we're very, very different. And even only at two hours, that's when DLS really says to you in a quantitative way, you've actually got some aggregates and you need to worry about it. We capture it much earlier than that. I'm not saying that it's better than DLS. It's better than the way people use DLS routinely, let's say that. But it truly does compare favorably to an existing technique, but it's faster and more sensitive and cheaper to run. I think, you know, I did take a lot of advice and talked to a lot of people when we were thinking about antibodies because they're so unique and special. And I talked to uh, Andy Watts in pharmacy and pharmacology in Bath. And we were just chatting over a beer. And if you know Andy, he likes to have a beer. And he said, well, this is all great. This is all nice. And he's always pushing, actually. He always wants the next stage, the next thing. And he said, but you know what would be really good is if you could actually predict the stability of antibodies. So I've been thinking about quality assurance at the end of a pipeline. But if you could predict the stability of an antibody, you come in when you're first developing a product and you can select for the most stable thing to start with. And that's going to mean your product is more likely to actually go through the pipeline. And I said, well, conceptually in protein chemistry, we're capturing information on rigidity and flexibility. And conceptually in protein chemistry, not conceptually, truly, a more rigid species is more stable. A more flexible species is more thermally unstable. So notionally, anything that's over on the left, in the rigid side of things, that should be more stable than anything over on the right, which is on the more flexible side of things. So what we did, I've got a couple of cute experiments here actually, is we took three antibodies, um, pertuzumab, interesting, you, might, um, you may have your own favorite therapeutic monoclonal, but my favorite is pertuzumab, my least favorite is in fact nivolumab. Uh, and we took three across the spectrum of sitting on the floor of my grass. So conceptually over here, Pertuzumab is the most rigid, and over here, in this scale, nivolumab is the most relatively flexible. And we would predict, therefore, that pertuzumab would be the most thermally stable, and nivolumab the least thermally stable. So we sat them at a set temperature, again, not too hot, just to tickle them to start forming some early stage aggregates. And what we found is our spot only shifts a little bit with pertuzumab, but then all the way up to an awful lot with nivolumab. And corresponding that to the DLS data, we find we get a ton of aggregates forming with nivolumab, but almost nothing with pertuzumab. So we truly are predicting the thermodynamic stability of these constructs. But these are three different antibodies. They're very, very close in structural space, but they are different. We wondered if we could play at formulation scientists. Now, formulation scientists, as a protein chemist, they, they're like wizards. They do amazing, amazing things. I mean, all we worry about, all the, the war you go through every day in protein biochemistry is instability of proteins. Um, formulation scientists do truly outstanding things to make proteins more stable. So what we did was we took, I think this probably kind of looks like pertuzumab to me, we took an antibody and we stripped all the adjuvants off. All the adjuvants that came with, we stripped them all off. And we said, well, if we're right, if we add an adjuvant back to it, we should be able to see the stabilizing effect of the adjuvant. So we put some glucose on it. So we put some glucose on, which is our red spot, and indeed you see that the spot hacks off to the left where the protein should be more stable and more rigid. But prove it, prove it, okay. So then we sat them, again, at a set temperature, now for ages, absolutely ages, I think this is weeks and weeks. 
And what we see is the spot moves a bit. It's a log scale here. The spot moves a bit for the sample with glucose, but it moves tons with the sample without glucose. And again, corresponding to the DLS profiles, lots of aggregates without glucose, rather less with glucose. So we've shown that protection. We've shown the prediction of stability and that we're entirely correct that it is, in fact, protect, protected. And I think that's amazing. Nothing that you could use routinely can do that. It's very, very powerful indeed, and we actually use it a lot. I think we've come an incredibly long way, and I'm really proud of kind of all the people that have worked on it. Um, I know it comes off as a bit of a sales pitch, but I think that's because we've got quite big claims. So I like to kind of sell it to you so you kind of believe, believe, in, the, believe in what we're doing. And lots of people have worked on it. They're really fantastic. It's nice that it's protected now. Patent's filed, and it's kind of going to go through because there's no prior art. Uh, it's really heavily validated. I've shown you lots of antibodies. Uh, we've also validated it with enzymes. Enzymes are proteins too. Regulatory proteins, things that you might sell as products. And it works really, really good. Uh, it's really, truly quantitative. And that's kind of important to me that it's quantitative. Because um, I'm a quantitative scientist. And we can accurately assess between 2 and 5% of unfolded or aggregated species. One of the exciting things, and I think one of the things that I kind of was naive about that people would get excited about, is that it's truly predictive of stability. And that's kind of really amazing and important to us. Something that's really important, I think, from a use perspective, is it's, I cannot stress enough how easy it is to do. It takes five minutes. It's not technically complex at all. All of the analysis is entirely automated down to the level of us saying it's aggregated, it's not aggregated, it's unfolded, it's not unfolded. Couldn't be easier. And it's plate reader compatible. So you can do it on 96 well plates. So you can imagine if you were formulating something new, you have 96 conditions. Which one's the most stable? That one. I think that's true power. Um, we're lucky. We had a great partner, I've got to say, with Bath ASU, who uh, uh, make patient-specific doses of therapeutic uh, monoclonal antibodies for the NHS. And they've been really instrumental in letting us have a ton of different antibodies and being really supportive. So I'm very grateful. Uh, the kind of unpleasant physical chemistry uh, is published in... Feb's J, and uh, hopefully all of the nice antibody kind of validation stuff that I've shown you today uh, should be, I hope, coming out in biochemistry pretty soon. Um, we've had some nice funding, and something really to, important to point out at the moment is we've got a postdoc whose sole job is to mediate people using the approach. Okay, so if you want to have a test of the approach, there's a free person to work for you who can do the kind of validation and testing that you want in your environment, if you want, or in our environment. And that person is there to be used. Okay? So if you're interested in it and you think you've got an application for it, just shout. Okay? Free person, free labor. Can't be bad. So what I've been doing. Hey, look, it didn't fall on the floor. It's okay. There's a thing at the front. I really love doing this, and it's great. We did wonder, however, it's so powerful if we could use it for something a little bit more. And at Bath, there's kind of a group of five academics, and we've got a program that we call Safe Drugs for Developing Countries. And we're just developing now as part of a global challenge research fund called Free PSRC. There are large parts of the country, large parts of the world, that cannot use biopharmaceuticals because there's no cold chain. Biopharmaceuticals are outstanding. They are, can be outstanding drugs, particularly some of these therapeutic antibodies can be outstanding drugs. But they are not accessible to large parts of the world because they are so labile to temperature. Okay? And if you form these soluble aggregates, which you surely do with a bit of temperature, they're toxic, and you can't give that to someone. What we would like to do, and we've actually come a long way with this already, we've got great partners in Kenya, at Mount Kenya University, and they've been fantastic and instrumental in helping us identify where we should go and what we should think about. What we want to do is fingerprint, take our cubes approach, fingerprint the therapeutic when it's made. That is just a fingerprint, and if the fingerprint changes, something's changed, okay? Asil Sabaeva is in the audience. I think I saw her work, walk in. She's got an approach where we wrap your protein in silica, and that protects it from degradation. We can then ship it to where you need it to be, and then benchmark it again, fingerprint it again to prove that it's safe to use, so it's not unfolded, so it's going to be active, and it's safe to use. There's no soluble aggregates present. And that's kind of some early data that we have, and it looks really fantastic. I think we're going to go a long way with that, and it's really exciting. And with that, my time is there. People work really hard, really great people, truly great scientists work on this, and I'm very grateful uh, to be working with them. And with that, I'll say thank you very much, and I'll happily take any questions. 
So what I should say is the thing at the front here, this is actually a portable version of our instrument. Okay, this goes in the suitcase, and when we go to Kenya, we're going to take that out there, and you can actually make the measurements in the field. Alternatively, in your environment, if you would like to test it out. Okay, well, thank you, Chris. That certainly sounds like a very exciting technology. Um, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, it's a great talk. Thanks for that. Um, I was wondering, you, you mentioned glucose. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, B so this is kind of one of my pet things that I like, actually. BSA uh, works by being a crowding agent, essentially. Uh, so it, has, it works by the excluded volume effect. Glucose has uh, partly that effect, but mostly it's viscogen-based. Uh, it's a whole long physical thing, but BSA also has a viscosity effect, macro and micro viscosity. Um, you sometimes get better effect just from the viscogen. Um, but you have lots of problems with sample delivery as stuff starts to get really viscous. As soon as you get up to high percentages of glucose, it's actually not something you can work with or deliver anymore. So I think there's a balance. There are good crowding agents that aren't BSA, okay, as well. So, um, so one of the antibodies, although they should be one compound, yeah. one compound yeah. with the glycosylation yeah. differences, so what does your technique uh, allow us to look at that composition? Yeah, I, I think that's what you get is it's an equal equilibrium approach. So you do capture the ensemble. Glycosylation, so actually trastuzumab and tamsin is really interesting for us because post-translational modifications, we actually use them as tricks to change the flexibility of molecules. They're actually very, very good at doing that. And trastuzumab and tamsin kind of you could think of as a post-translational modification. It just makes it more rigid. But absolutely, you would capture that post-translational modification effect but you don't see the, trans the, the modification because it doesn't give you any signal. But you would see the stabilizing effect of it. But yes, it is an equilibrium measurement. So we aren't separating out those species that are uh, post-translation post modified versus not. But if you've got a change in the population of those that are modified, so more rigid likely, you'll see that shift. So the general formulation, if the whole thing is different, you'll see that swing. Okay, last question. Um, I was wondering whether your technique has limitation uh, to, with the size. No of limitations. No. Oh. <laughs> we don't know. So, so for example, if um, um, that would work with small molecules. Um, yeah. So it doesn't well. need to be something big like an antibody. Um, it's a long story. We talk about how we developed it. We developed it for much smaller proteins initially. It, it, all you require is that you've got a tryptophan residue in there, and pretty not every, but very the vast majority of proteins do have that. So this is a nice thing. It's based on intrinsic emission. You don't add a fluorophore to it. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.